Good. In the last week, I spoke about the most important terms which necessary to define, to understanding a lot, lot of lot, lot, uh, long history of uh, vertical economy system. The first one, which I defined in the last week, uh, space. How we can describe? How we can describe and understand the meaning, the different levels of meaning of space? This was the first one. The second one, a time. In the last week, I spoke about uh, the most important, uh, uh, in the first point of view, uh, looking and uh, describing a time with help of different calendar, calendar system. Probably you remember that a uh, human civilization used a calendar system based on astronomical experiences, moon calendar and sun calendar. Later applied a rhythm of vegetation after the agrarian revolution and later the liturgical hours after appearance of great religion system. And very important were the, the most important devices of measuring of time. This is the one side. Other one, a philosophical and scientific concept of time. Uh, we divided two concepts of, uh, of, uh, of time, a uh, scientific uh, meaning of time, a linear, irreversible and cumulative time concept and the cycle time concept. And this uh, slide was the last one. And I tried to demonstrate that some historical event we can uh, describe according to old style uh, time concept. The old style time concept which used in the 19th century uh, a linear, irreversible and cumulative time concept. It's exponential, exponential trajectory, a green line uh, show and demonstrate the linear, irreversible and, uh, and cumulative time co concept. In the last week I spoke about a world population, a world population. If we are looking at the uh, population history uh, uh, 6,000 uh, years before uh, the Christian calendar, a uh, number of humankind no more than 5,000 in Africa, 5,000. A uh, human species was on the threshold of uh, disappearance. And very interesting, after this critical period, it was the great disaster, natural disaster, probably a drought in Africa, uh, step by step increased the population. On the time of Christian calendar, the starting date of Christian calendar, estimate to 200, 300 uh, uh, million, uh, whole of the global population. Uh, at the beginning of 19th century, one million, uh, uh, the last year of Second World War, 2.5 million, and recently uh, estimate to 8 million. And my last question was, which I tried to demonstrate, it's not a uh, continuous uh, exponential trajectory. We will stop the growth of population in consequence of uh, demographical transformation, a modernization. The modernization is the most efficient break of population growth. Okay, the second one, energy per capita. Energy per capita. It's very interesting how changed the quantity of energy. I spoke about the energetical history, I, I, I remember, anyway, uh, how we can describe, uh, how we can describe, uh, according to point of view of the law of energy, a human history I spoke about. Yes or no? No, okay, good. Look at a human history according to flow of energy. Flow of energy. 99 percent, 99 percent of human used and based energy came and come from sun. I didn't. I spoke about. It. Okay, we are over. Next step. Look at the human consumption. Uh, I spoke, if I spoke about an uh, energetical slave, energetical slave, no. Energetical slave introduced by American scholar. Why? Because if we are discussing about quantity of kilojoule or calorie, it's very difficult, very difficult to imagine. It's a lot or, or not so much. 
very difficult to judge. But look at, for example, like in the movie of, Ma of Matrix, you know, Matrix, one, four, two, three. In the Matrix, how used are human? How used? Like, like a cell of energy, like a cell of energy. And we can calculate the consumption of human energy. If calculate one, one human, not male or female, one human, seven kilograms, seven kilograms, working whole of the day, without vacancy, without relaxation, all of the day, 24 hours continuously working. This is the one energetical slave. Abstraction, of course. Energetical slave. How many energetical slaves used in United States before the great oil fuel crisis? In 70s, 80s. How many? One, it's switch on the light, switch on the TV, computer, uh, using the car, public transport, so and so. How many energetical slave? This is my first guess. How many? I know that the US population. I know that the US population. I didn't. As much as the US population. Yeah, but one US citizen. How many energetical slave? A number. You have to tell a number. How many energetical slave using? One day. Sorry. <laughs> I am bad for you. Moreover, moreover, the mass is like, for example, uh, okay. How many number? Two hundred million. No, no. One, one citizen. One. <laughs> Some places in the third world. One. But in the United States, in the United States, one citizen, one citizen, day by day, using 78 persons. The quantity of energy which used in Europe a little bit less because it's uh, uh, more uh, saving uh, mentality introduced much before uh, in the United States, changed dif in different country between 60 to 65. Who used 20, 60 or 65 slave, are not energetical slave, a real slave. Why is so interesting? Look at the trajectory of human evolution. When started, for example, early human subspecies, Australopithecus, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, and others, uh, used the somatical energy. One human used one human somatical energy, no more. After agrarian evolution, after domestication of animals, for example, camels, for example, cattle, horses, and others uh, introduced, uh, improved the basis and enlarged the basis of uh, energetical background with the strength and drought power of domesticated animals and the simple engine, like windmill and like a water mill. And after introduction, of, uh, of uh, industrial revolution, a huge quantity of energy launched and activated by human. Therefore, not by chance, recent time after industrial revolution, named Anthropocene, probably you listen to this term, Anthropocene. Anthropocene means uh, age of human because in consequence of industrial revolution, a uh, play and the position of human same became a similar like a geological power, a cyclone and the earthquake and the ocean current, the same energy activated by human. Okay, 
And the last one, information, quantity of information. Uh, in the early human history, one of the most important innovation of human was a cultural evolution. A cultural evolution. A generation by generation passed information. Didn't necessarily uh, invent or, or create a, a former generation knowledge. But the next milestone, uh, uh, inventing of, uh, of, uh, of writing, and the next milestone, uh, introducing of uh, machinery of printing. In Europe, it's uh, how the name is uh, inventor, a German guy. Ah, nobody knows. Who introduced the first print? Gutenberg. Gutenberg, takes out. Okay, it's a quite a late, therefore, uh, <laughs> uh, therefore I'm a little bit exhausted and, uh, and uh, information uh, not so easy to activate. Gutenberg. And after appearance of computer and the cyberspace, recently very easy to publish, like me, for example, in my YouTube channel, information. Therefore, the trajectory of information, it's uh, follow uh, uh, exponential trajectory. Why is it so interesting? Because in the traditional time was the basic problem picking the information. Recently, on the age of cyberspace, the selecting of information, this is the most important uh, challenge of uh, generation. Okay, look at the third concept which is necessary to define, a verb economy concept, uh, system concept. If we are looking at uh, uh, history and the direction of historical researches, uh, each generation of uh, historian, of scholar, there is and there were a main question. A lot of small questions, but one main question. When appeared a history in the 19th century, this was the age of nationalism, age of formation of nation. Why so important? Because before the 19th century, we can describe the history of humankind according to empires. Empires. It's possible that I spoke about yet that uh, the most important guiding force of human integration, period by period, age by age, changed. Look at, for example, why it killed, why it killed one person to other in the Middle Ages? The religious problem, for example. In, Hung in uh, European history, one of the most cruel period was the age of reformation and counter-reformation. The people killed each other because one community became Calvinist, other Roman Catholic, killed each other, killed each other. Not by chance, if we are looking at uh, description of Europe in the historical past, until the 17th century, Europe named mainly, it's calculated with big data uh, technology, Christendom, Christendom. And after the 17th and mainly in the 18th century, named rather Europe, changed the concept. The guiding force changed. And before 18th century, much more, the guiding force was the religion, which the identity structure determined, and after uh, uh, how the name enlightenment, age of enlightenment, a uh, science, a uh, scientific approach, structure, much more a uh, personal uh, identi identity structure. Uh, not by chance, when appeared after the French Revolution a new guiding force, it's like a common culture and a common language. Look at, for example, uh, empire, age of empire. In Hungary, for example, official language was a Latin until the middle of the 19th century. Why? Because the, the role of language on the age of empire not so important. The common culture, not so important. 
Look at the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, if somebody was born as a nobleman, this was the currency. If somebody was born in Spain as nobleman and moved to Hungary, he was a nobleman too. He was the nobleman too. This was true for the peasant and for the bourgeoisie. Therefore, the social status, the social position determined. Not the language, not the uh, uh, common culture. But since the beginning of 19th century, appeared a national state, a national state, which, which, which uh, uh, constructed a uh, a uh, civil and, uh, and uh, military bureaucracy and uh, financed a new, a new uh, how the name, chapel on the church of, uh, of disciplines, the university and academical institute, and ask legitimate. And a contemporary historian wrote a uh, six or five or ten volumes about a history of German a formation of Hungarian state, formation of Romanian state, everywhere, everywhere. It's a global epidemic. And uh, the crucial question of the 19th century was uh, how formed and how uh, unfolded a national history of national states. Therefore, the typical direction of uh, 19th century historical uh, research, political history, legal history, and uh, ecclesiastical history. This is the first layer of the history. But at the beginning of 20th century, realized that the global economy influenced everyday life of human everywhere everywhere on the earth and up here a new question how formed are economical integration and economical activities and up here economic history and the third question a mass society which appeared in the 30s of 20th century and up here the social history and demographic history and the next milestone in the 60s, when a psychology influenced a historical, uh, historical researches and, uh, and uh, history and try to um, understand the motivation, inner motivation of decision of human and up here, a uh, uh, research of mentality. Why react, for example, Mediterranean guy, different part like uh, Scandinavian? Scandinavia. Uh, there is a Turkish student here. Turkish student, okay. Uh, very interesting. Once I visited in Istanbul, I drove and I enjoyed. I enjoyed. Why? Because first experience of me crying all of the day without real anger. It's a Mediterranean mentality. Because in Istanbul, if somebody driving in downtown of Istanbul, no rules, no rules. In Switzerland, everybody follow each rules. But the basic problem, for example, driving in Central Europe, the driver accept only half of rules, but nobody knows which half, because it's a flexible. It's very simple situation driving in Switzerland, it's clear. Driving in Istanbul, clear situation, no rules. Break and bad, break and bad, and crying to each other. I was so relaxed at the end of the day <laughs> that I cried continuously. It's not my normal nature, it's crying, but okay. Uh, mentality. How react the people for the, for example, situation? So, cycle history name. And the last one, ecological history, environmental history which appeared in the last decades of the 20th century, which realized that there are and there were a dub nature of the human, dub nature of the human, uh, ecological actor, 
and uh, cultural bureau. Good. Uh, the first generation of historian which turned over economic history was a French historical school. It's named Annal School. Annal, this is the name one French journal. It's a legendary. There is a historian in the audience. Historian? No historian. But you believe me, uh, it's a legendary, legendary uh, uh, journal of the 20th century. Uh, two people founded uh, Lucien Favre and Bar Bloch and introduced uh, two basic concepts. The first one, Histoire totale. It's very easy to translate to English. Histoire totale, total history. Everything, everything which did by human in the past, this is the subject of historical research. Not only, uh, for example, great military operation, not only deeds of the king and the generals, no, everybody. For example, the cloth. If you visit in the museum and look at one door, a faceless door, and look at the cloth, you can judge the age, in the traditional cloth, of course, the age, the social status, the marital status, everything. Because the cloth, this is one form of coding, a code, a code. But very interesting, in the individual society, a modern society, everybody believes that it's a free decision. It's not true, but the marketing manipulates our decision. It's very interesting looking at the people uh, approaching on the Vogue side, everywhere, and we can divide four or five different types. Siu Day or, or I don't know, Zara and other. It's no, simplified, but not a traditional. It's an illusion, illusion of the free, the free decision. No, in the traditional society, much simpler. The cloth was a social code. Okay, and for other one, uh, for example, spitting. Spitting. It's a judge of the spitting. In Europe, for example, spitting under taboo. If somebody there is a problem inside of the mouth, in Asian traditional Asian society, there is a spitting bowl for cleaning mouth. This is the normal problems, social problem. One society, one civilization, two under taboo. Other one, there is a device for solving the problem or other ways of cleaning the nose. This is the subject of historical research. How solved this everyday problem a different civilization? Okay, the second one, long durée, long duration, long duration. Why so important innovation, a long durée, a long duration? You remember the secular cycle of Fernand Broda? Because a traditional historian in the 18th, uh, 19th century Try to describe the human history according to generation. The rhythm of human life. How long one generation? Generally calculate, it's a 25, 25 years long period, one generation. It's one approach. Other one, for one generation, a collective experience. For example, one generation, who survived the First World War, second generation who survived the Second World War, a generation of the great rewards of 68, you remember it's a university, United States, in Western part of Europe, somehow a collective experience make a common generation uh, knowledge uh, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, self, uh, uh, how the name, self knowledge is, uh, we can see. For example, I am uh, a member of generation of system change at the turn of uh, 80s and 90s. Uh, because I was young, I finished my university studies, opened the Western countries, I traveled to the, uh, Switzerland, France, uh, uh, Germany, uh, the Netherlands, opened the, opened the gate. The former generation, generation of, of my father, lived behind the Iron Curtain. No chance for travel abroad. No chance for travel abroad. Good. Uh, 
Second generation is a Fernand Broder, later I will speak about, and the third generation of Anna School, Leroy Emmanuel Leroy Ladurie. Good. Uh, how appear a world economic system concept? The key person of third world economic system are American economists. His name, Immanuel Wallerstein. He published one book uh, in uh, 1974. Uh, and very interesting this book. Why? Because Immanuel Wallerstein, after his graduation, received a diploma, didn't find a job in the United States. It may happen with everybody. I remember when I finished my university studies, every, everybody, including me, became a drunk heart. Drunk so much. Why? A uh, closing of studies, it's one of the most important boundaries of life. Why? Because uh, the lifestyle on the working place, compared with the university, it's basically different. This is the first. Secondly, the chance, the chance of uh, finding a good job, it's so limited, was, I don't know recently which uh, is the, the, the chances, but in my uh, period, uh, at the end of the 80s, it was a, a, a close period of the socialism, it was very bad. And everybody, it's drunk. And uh, this was the same situation in the case of Immanuel Wallerstein, no job, therefore, travel to Africa and participated in uh, a different uh, uh, humanitarian program in South Africa, in Mozambique, in, in different parts, in Congo. And it was very interesting experience of him and turned toward the analysis of the world economy system. This program, this economical uh, uh, regeneration of recurring program, it's fate. Every program failed and finally realized by Immanuel Wallerstein, it's not personal, uh, uh, personal uh, fail of the participant of the program, no, the basic, pro problem, uh, basic uh, problem of, uh, of uh, these, pro uh, these countries and these region that uh, African countries participate in global trade and the global economic system with the lowest uh, rank cards, the worst cards. If somebody playing with the worst cards, no chance for winning, no chance for winning. And the next step, when formed this system, this rank list among the countries, and according to conclusion of Immanuel Wallerstein, a global economic system formed on the time of uh, great geographical discoveries. A great geographical discoveries. In the, 19, uh, in the uh, uh, 15th and the uh, 16th century, basically. The next step, the next milestone, is two years later, when one uh, British uh, scholar published about agrarian roots of European capitalism. In the first uh, approach, it's not great innovation. No great innovation. So bad. So, yeah, not feeling bad. No problem, no problem. Okay, only I try to take under pressure. <laughs> Good. Uh, uh, Robert Brenner uh, described how capitalized uh, medieval agriculture. Why so important? Because in Europe, at the beginning of 20th century, discussed a lot about uh, uh, roots of uh, capitalism in the European evolution, European historical evolution. Why is so interesting? Because if we are looking at medieval society, who, who, which uh, the social class is and was on the top of medieval society? A nobility. Which are the most important values of nobility? Braveness and, uh, and uh, military uh, capacity and military uh, success and so and so. And compare 
with the capitalism, no connection. Why? Because which is the most important uh, good uh, and the goods of the capitalism? Rational decision and the production of benefit, production of the profit. No connection with the medieval mentality because it's a brainless and the military success and the winning of uh, battle and so and so. Therefore, two important German scholar, Werner Zumbart, Werner Zumbart, and Max Weber, it's possible you know his name, Max Weber, discuss about root of capitalism. According to argumentation of Werner Zomberg, a capitalism appeared like a virus, like a virus, came out from capital, came out from the uh, European medieval society. Why? Because making interest, taking, sorry, not making, taking interest is prohibited by Roman Catholic Church. But exceptional social groups like Jews, like Armenians, like Muslim, may taking interest for loan, for loaning uh, to, for example, noblemen or, or, or royal court or, or everybody. Therefore, the conclusion of Werner's own work that foreign people imported the capitalism and the capitalist mentality uh, to Europe. But Max Weber, other German historian, scholar, polymath, we can mention, because Max Weber antecedent not only the history, but the economy, uh, uh, the sociology and economics too. Okay, look at Max Weber. Max Weber, conclusion of the Max Weber, the capitalism appeared in Europe, more closer in the Netherlands. Somebody visited in the Netherlands? Okay, it's an unbelievable place. I, I lived half year uh, near to Amsterdam in the uh, Dutch Academy. Uh, I receive a, a scholarship <laughs> in consequence of, of uh, uh, political system change. Okay, a turn back. Why is so interesting the Dutch history? Because a Dutch Republic or, or low country, this was the historical name, low country was a part of Habsburg Empire, revolted against the Habsburg Empire, and Dutch Republic became independent uh, in the long independence war. It's named a 40 years long war. 40 years long war. Look at the structure of medieval society. It's a classical social pyramid. Majority of population, peasant, 10% or 20% bourgeoisie, and the top of pyramid are nobility. But at the beginning of uh, Dutch independence, long Dutch independence war, uh, first phase, almost each of noblemen by Habsburg army, Slaughter, killed. Therefore, in Netherlands formed a truncated society, a truncated society without real nobility. Therefore, the leader of 80 years long independence war, directed by bourgeoisie, very, very rich bourgeoisie. If looking, for example, a painting, a great Dutch painter, Rubens, Werner, Van Haas, others, painted this elite, which was and which were the most important peculiarity of Dutch elite. The first one, Calvinist. He was a reform church follower. How many percent of, uh, uh, in the Dutch population was Calvinist? 
20% but very powerful minority. A little bit the same situation like in the American political history, you know probably a WESP. Somebody know? WESP. White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. How many person of American population? White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Recently lower in consequence of uh, uh, South American immigration. But look at, for example, a list of American presidents. Since George Washington until Biden, only two American presidents were, were, were white Anglo Saxon Protestant. Who? Somebody know? Obama? But Obama, it's very interesting, border case, because his father came from Kenya. No any connection to the slavery. First, but his mother, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, therefore, his father went back to Africa, and in the socialization of Obama, followed the same trajectory, like white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. He learned in the same elementary, secondary school and the university. The same community. Who was the other exception? GFK. John Fitcher at Canada. Why? He was Irish. And the majority of Irish, Catholic, Catholic. But no any other. Why Anglo-Saxon Protestant? This is the same situation in the case of Dutch history. Only 20 person, only 20 person, a Calvinist uh, uh, ship owners lived in Amsterdam. But his power demonstrates well that at the beginning of 17th century, whole of Europe existed 12,000 great merchant vessels which organized the international trade, 12,000. It's including Venetian Republic, France, Spain, everything, 12. And 6,000 sailed under Amsterdam, the Dutch flag. It's show and demonstrate well how strong was a Dutch bourgeoisie, mainly lived in Amsterdam. Adam. Adam, this is the short, short version. Therefore, a capitalism, which was the mentality of the Dutch people, a Dutch merchant, rational decision, and make a profit, make a benefit. Not by chance, a title of the book of Max Weber, title of the famous book of Max Weber, The Spirit of Capitalism, Calvinism and the Spirit of Capitalism. Because according to concept of Max Weber, a uh, mentality of capitalism appeared with the Reformation. Okay, good. Next milestone. Uh, one year later, published a very seminal uh, study about the proto-industrialization. Proto Why is so important the proto-industrialization? Because before the real industrial revolution, mainly in part of Western Europe, launched a proto-industrialization. How we can imagine a proto-industrialization? Look at, for example, one village in England. Live, living in the village of uh, 500 inhabitants. In the English village, living, for example, live a uh, free artisan, specialized a uh, textile industry somehow. But this uh, free uh, artisan specialized to the pro production for the inhabitant of village. 
but in the traditional world, no uh, competition, no real trading and production competition. Probably you know the term of guild. Guild. This is the organization of the of the artisan living in the city. A guild limited everything. The number of master, the number of artisan, the number of participants of the production, everything. Why? Because the most important interest, the avoiding any form of competition. But some trader who would like to maximize the profit visited in the village's artisan and offered to them a part-time worker status. There is, for example, a great, uh, great uh, wave of the of the trade. For example, a shoe or or coat production. The trader maximized the production because visited lot of lot of local villages. And in the traditional peasant society, a lot of free time for the peasant. A lot of free time. Uh, somebody came from the villages, villages people, no, urban people, everybody. Okay, look at, for example, agrarian production, a uh, wheat production. When necessary to work on the field for wheat, wheat, wheat production, cereal production. On the period of plowing and sowing and on the period of harvesting, a lot of free time. In the traditional time, for villages people, a lot of free time. Therefore, in the period of uh, great wave of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, trading wave, introduced by trader a lot of villages artisans and maximized the production. After the wave of product, after the great conjuncture, closing the conjuncture, it's closed the and Close the uh, close the uh, close the um, uh, the collaboration. No, any problem, because these artisans partly were peasant and decreased the uh, industrial activity and in the great uh, recovery period, decrease, increase, decrease, increase, and when started industrial revolution moved to the factory, not peasant, but the people who somehow socialized for industrial production. This is the reason why blew up our English Industrial Revolution, because educating the peasant before a real industrial revolution for industrial collaboration. Okay, this is the proto-industrialization, and finally, Fernand Brodel, who was a professor of Immanuel Wallerstein, restructured the concept of uh, uh, world economy system. Okay, this is the this one picture about Immanuel Wallerstein and the most important books of him. And look at, because very important, I ah, know. It's a jump. Later we will return because I, I don't know how uh, can I make uh, a voice. Okay, look at Fernand Brodel. Fernand Brodel restructured the concept of world economy system and published three seminal book. The first one is a French Restructure quotidienne possible et impossible. This is the production, production of meals and production of food and beverages. The second one, Les Jeux de l'échange, this is the trade, how change the uh, surplus between different uh, settlements and region, and finally, the global system, le temps du, temps, uh, le temps du monde, the time of, uh, of, uh, of globe. Okay, this is the English version. Good. So jump. Look at the most important terms of the world economy system. Uh, the first term, World economy, this is the frame of different economical integration. And the second one, world hyphen economy, economy bond uh, in French. The second one, the second uh, term describe a uh, steady economic integration. 
in the 12th, in the, uh, 12th century, if we are looking whole of the world, this is the rank list of uh, economic monde, economic integration. The first one, China. It's very interesting. Why? A Chinese and the Chinese history and even the Chinese politician are uh, sorry citing two historical experiences that uh, China was the most developed civilization whole of the human history after the early age of early uh, early human history and the industrial revolution and the age of uh, geographical discovery it's a it's a it's a temporary uh, temporary changes of the real rank list but the last decade verified that China turned back to the pole position as lost in the before the industrial revolution the second one India the second one India and very interesting in the 12th century uh, if we are looking not the whole of the civilization but the regional scale which region was the most developed until the industrial revolution this region named Bengalia. Bengalia. Somebody know which uh, country located in Bengalia recently? Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Why? Why so developed country was uh, Bengalia? Because in the traditional time, there is a bar. In the traditional time, majority. 80 or 90 percent of population were peasant. Therefore, the source of richness of uh, traditional society was the productivity of agriculture. Look at Bengalia. Great rivers, Ganges, Brahmaputra, came from the Himalaya and they made a large fluvial, uh, how the name is, uh, field, fluvial. Uh, plain, fluvial plain. This is the India, it's Delta. In the Ganges, this is Bengal, the richest region, the richest region, whole of the uh, medieval and early modern history. A uh, American economic historian calculated a uh, GDP, gross domestic products. It's artificial a li little bit, but able to compare a global position. In the 20 years before the launching of Industrial Revolution, uh, 1760, a uh, GDP of Bengalia calculated 290 US dollars. 290 US dollar in Bengalia, in Bengalia. In the United States, 190 dollars. In England, 210 dollars. In France, it's 108 dollars. Why so interesting? Because recently, poorest country, whole of the world, whole of the world. Size of, uh, uh, size of uh, Bangladesh, it's uh, compar comparable with Hungary, for example, uh, uh, 150,000 square kilometer, and the population 160 million, recently, 160 million, unbelievable. Uh, and, uh, uh, for example, some years ago, I read a scenarios about uh, a third world, world war. In which region we start? Recently, Ukraine improved the position, his position. But uh, the first one, somebody know which is the most probable uh, starting place of, uh, of uh, global war? So, uh, North Korea. North Korea, first one. And Bangladesh, the second one. Bangladesh is the second one. Why? Because there are a lot of conflict, migration conflict with India. 
because Bangladesh is a Muslim country, but India not, it's a Hindu country, and a lot of conflict, and covered with a huge fence system. Fence system. 3.6 meter high fence system. It's closed whole of the Bengali. And moreover, one of the most important regional consequences of global, global warming, rising of water level. And one third of Bengali, one to five meter higher only the water level of global ocean, Indian Ocean. It's very dangerous, not only for the rising of water level, but the salt water infiltration to the soil, destroy each possibility of the, of the, of the um, economic activity, agrarian activity. And never believe that there is a broader country, Pakistan. Nuclear power. I don't know. I am not able to uh, forecast the future. But India was the second one. The second one in the high Middle Ages. The third one, Islamic world. Islamic world. Uh, uh, early Middle Ages, it was a great heyday of Muslim world. For example, in the Cordovan Caliphate, everybody know which is the location of the Cordovan Caliphate? Cordovan Caliphate locate uh, Iberian Peninsula. Recently, it's uh, Portugal and uh, Spain. It was the Cordovan Caliphate. In the high early Middle Ages, occupied by Muslim, uh, Muslim uh, invaders, and it was one of the most developed country, whole of the early Middle Ages. Whole of the early Middle Ages. According to con contemporary statistics, each, ma each uh, male lived in Cordovan Caliphates, was able to read and write. Unbelievable, unbelievable, unbelievable. Uh, not by chance, in the global uh, rank list, economic rank list, the third position is a Muslim world. Fourth, a Western and Central Europe. Later I will speak about the meaning of Europe. It's different uh, in the recent uh, uh, situation. Amerindian culture. It's an Inca and Aztec empire. Uh, some indicator most developed. For example, a Maya, a Maya scholar, whole of the global history introduced first the concept of zero. Concept of zero. First, a Arabic mathematician only in the eighth uh, century introduced the zero. It was a great innovation. But the handicap of uh, uh, Amerindian culture lived in the Copper Age. Copper Age wasn't able to make a uh, uh, metallurgy and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, iron weapons and iron devices. And the know, know, uh, knowing and the knowledge concerning the zero on the battlefield, not so useful. Uh, and finally, the sixth one, a Russia. A Russia. It's a very, very strange uh, taking to the last position, a Russia. It's a Vladimir Vladimirovich, which probably not uh, so happy for that. But uh, Russia uh, in uh, uh, Middle Ages is a very special position located. Among Chinese, Muslim, and the European culture. And very interesting, position of Russia, only ruling years of Peter the Great moved toward to Europe. But very interesting, in Europe, in the geographical Europe, only two countries are where the people lived in the country, moved to everywhere in Europe, it's declared, I go to Europe. One, Russia, because it's uh, somehow defined out of Europe, but it's a part of Europe. Somebody know which country is other one, 
which inhabitants, when travel, for example, to France, to Hungary, to Spain, declare, I go to Europe. Nobody? England. England. Very interesting. Two poles, which are part of Europe, geographical sense, but themselves defined out of Europe. I go to Europe from St. Petersburg, from Bristol. It's interesting. It's a mental history. It's a demonstration of the mental history. Good. How we can define economic integration? According to our concept, India, China, Muslim world, Amerindian culture, Europe, Russia, was economic integration. Economic world. How we can define it? It's a wrong definition. It's a little bit more character. The first uh, indicator of definition, area demarcated well, circums we are able to circumscribe the boundaries. Look at, for example, Russia. Between Russia and China, a natural boundary, a Gobi Desert. Gobi Desert. Only one caravan going to China and back to Moscow. No more. It's a Gobi Desert because so expensive crossing through the desert, therefore nobody. Or only exceptional one caravan going back. A little bit same situation in history of Africa between the white and the black Africa, a Sahara Desert. It's a natural boundary. Very high the expense. It's possible, but very high the expense. Area, we can define the boundary. The second one, directly one central city. In the European world economy, or economy world, the first leading and guiding city was Venice. The second one, Antwerp. The third one, Genoa, the fourth one, uh, Amsterdam, and the fifth one, uh, London. The following are uh, New York. It's out of Europe, therefore it's not a European integration part. Why so important only one directed city? Because, according to broader definition, according to uh, steady, reliable function of the economic integration, Necessary, only one focus, no more, only one. If we are looking at the recent situation concerning the world economy system, there are at least three poles. East Coast, in the United States, around New York. Uh, uh, southeastern part of Asia, former time Japan, recently writer, south part of China. And the third one, European Union. According to this indicator, this element of definition, a global world economic system unstable because when function as usual, a world economic system, one focus on it, no more. Recently, somehow, according to this definition indicator, we are, we are living in transitory period, a transitory period. Living transitory period, not so easy. Okay, look at the next one. Economically hierarchical area. A world economy system, there are core area, peripheral area, and semi-peripheral area. Defining a core area, not so complicated. Everything very expensive. The most expensive region it's core area. Other corner, it's a peripheral area, very frequent, a barter trade. No currency, no money, only barter. Used to and, and help to each other. <coughs> but much difficult to define a semi-periphery area. Look at, for example, one historical example. A France, history of France. France is a very developed country. Look at, for example, a 17th century. 17th century was a, a, a very critical period. Uh, Kenneth Pomeranz, it's a famous American uh, historian, wrote a book, A Great Divergence. A Great Divergence. 
According to the approach of Kenneth Pomerantz, in the 17th century, diverted a two direction of world, a European type evolution and the Asian type evolution. I don't know if it's true or not, but very interesting in the 17th century. It's an age of great divergence. And uh, uh, in this period, one of the most powerful country, whole of Europe, a France, under ruling years of uh, uh, King Louis XIV. His name, uh, uh, son of king, whose uh, empire never, um, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, the sun never uh, set, and each days, even in America, northern part of Louisiana, or in the French part of empire, there is a, it's a, it's a sun uh, rise somehow. In this period, a uh, size of bureaucracy and size of army, it's the largest, whole of Europe, whole of Europe, uh, a number of soldier of French army, half million, half million in the traditional age. It's a great uh, military bureaucracy operation was. And in this period, on the ruling years of uh, Louis XIV, it's a crucial question. It's a core area country or semi-peripheral area country. In the first approach, according to indicator of uh, military power, uh, 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 civil budget, uh, civil bureaucracy, and uh, income of, uh, of uh, government, is a core area. But it's not true. It's a not true. It's a semi-peripheral country. Semi Why? Because Fernand Brodo used as indicator which is the place where the most important economic decision made. In the French history, the most important economic decision concerning the French economy made in Amsterdam. Why? Because in the 12,000 merchant vessels, half of whole of European fleet sailed under Dutch flag. Therefore, the export of French economy, about the export of French economy, decided in Amsterdam by Dutch merchant. Look at, for example, Hungary. It's obviously the most important decision about the Hungarian economy make in Berlin, in, I don't hope, but possible in Moscow, in Peking, and New York. Not in Budapest, because we are a semi-peripheral area. And not so easy change in, the, in this position. For example, Louis XIV would like to move up to the core position, even attacked uh, the Netherlands and occupied large part of the Netherlands. But not so easy, this operation, moving in the core area. Okay, good. Look at Europe. This is the last uh, concept which uh, I try to define today. If we are looking at a history of Europe, first time appear a uh, name of Europe in a Greek myth. Abduction of Europe, abduction of Europe. Europe, a Phoenician princess, a Phoenician princess who walked on the uh, on the uh, sea coast of the uh, Near East, on the Mediterranean Sea coast, and the map with Zeus. Zeus, it's a it's a god of uh, of uh, uh, of uh, Greek pantheon, lived in Olympus. Uh, how, how do, uh, Olympus. Olympus, thanks. In Olympus, uh, he was the main god of the, of the large uh, family of the god and goddess in the Greek mythology. And Zeus appeared as white bull, a little bit discussed and, and spoke about his ambition, and uh, it was the great uh, example of seduction. seduction. 
because in the in the uh, in the in the bull there are not arm. Therefore, necessary arguing, sitting up to the back of uh, of uh, of uh, bull, and after it's sit up and run with the uh, euro. Therefore, the first appearance of uh, name of euro appeared in this Greek map. Abduction of the of the women it's a quite typical uh, quite uh, uh, typical in the ambitious people and um, ambitious folks appearance of the ambitious folks we are stealing uh, everything which possible look at for example in the roman history roman history abduction of the sabine women or in the hungarian history uh, started with the abduction of the of the of the of the uh, daughter of uh, of dual king dual it's it's quite a typical okay first but in the greek geography existed three continents the first one europe very important to mention until the modern time since the greek geography the eastern boundary of europe was a don river no Ural mountain don river the scale of Europe, a traditional Europe, concept of Europe, much, uh, much uh, smaller, much smaller, uh, because no, the Ural mountain closed, Don River, a uh, western pillar, a uh, <laughs> western boundary, a uh, pillar of Hercule. It's a Gibraltar, it's a G Strait of Gibraltar. The second continent was Asia, and the third continent of the classical Greek. Geography of uh, Libya, it's really Africa, Africa. but uh, the Greek geographer knew only a northern part of, uh, uh, northern part of Africa which named to Libya. But when uh, on the time of uh, Catherine the Great started the geographical description and the cartographical description of Russia, uh, this is the same time happened everywhere in Europe, for example Hungarian uh, cartographical description happened the same time. Uh, uh, this operation organized a uh, guest worker, Philip Johann Stahlenberg, Swedish officer and geographer. He introduced as a real, reliable more, uh, eastern boundary as a Ural mountain. Until the 18th century, increased the geographical perspective and size of Europe until the Ural mountain. Why so interesting? Because on the Middle Ages we discuss about concept of Eastern Europe or Central Europe. The scale it's basically different. If we, we are, for example, we try to define the position of Europe, of Hungary, a Hungarian kingdom in the Middle Ages, Eastern Europe, of course. But in modern time, it's Central Europe. Scale changed. Okay, more thousand kilometers, a difference. Okay, thanks a lot for your attention, but I start uh, the next one. Yeah, but uh, uh, I have a, a, a very strange experience because it's possible I, I told you that uh, uh, I taught uh, at the Central European University. Former time is, uh, was a Budapest, but recently moved to emigration to no, no, no closing, no closing. Some slide I will, uh, I will, uh, I, I will show, uh, and uh, and I try to argue in why, and uh, I taught uh, a different student, different part of the world, from Kazakhstan to United States, and very interesting the different mentality of uh, different student, because. Uh, in Europe, we are living a German-like, German-like education system, which based on the huge quantity of the information from natural sciences to social sciences, and a strict control by the parents and the teacher, and communicate each other. In American. Uh, education system basically different. Why? Because American system based on the most important efforts 
a character construction, free discussion, free discussion about different problems, and learn to argue it, beside or counter arguing. Very interesting, and compared with the European scale, it's no knowledges, no relevant knowledges. But it's not, not a pity. Why? Look at, for example, history. If somebody learns history in the elementary school, start with human evolution and close the recent history. Look at the secondary school. Start with human evolution and close with human history. Look at the university. Start with human evolution and close to the recent. Therefore, repeat, repeat, repeat. And the compensation, possibility of compensation is continuous. Continuous. And very interesting, the behavior, the behavior of European and the American student, it was evident. Uh, for example, I walk into the lecture room, I identify the European student. Saving, saving everything, it's avoid the eye contact and saving the little part of the body. The uh, American, it's, it's for example, I take one question, and American is rouse the hand. And silly thing, he spoke, but launched the discussion. It's very different. Uh, for, yeah, but once, uh, when I uh, close, to my close my lecture at the Central European University, have 10 minutes, 10 minutes. And I told to the audience, no problem, we closed one item, one scientific item, we will continue in the next week. And the American student rose the hand. I paid for this lecture and I asked the service until the end of lecture time. And he was a true. He was a true. And therefore, I continue until the lecture time. Good. Okay, it's Europe. We are over the Europe. Okay, the next question. The birth date, definition of the birth date of European civilization. How we can define? Of course, it depends on the indicator of, uh, of birth date. The first birth date, when the Hans, probably you listen about the Hans, it's a nomadic people, his, his king was Attila. A Hans crossed the Volga River and pushed the nomadic people, basically, German nomadic people to the direction of Roman Empire and start the age of migration. And the waves of age of, age of migration destroyed the Western Roman Empire, but the Eastern Roman Empire survived, survived with 1,000 years long. Okay? Hans Xingnu, because came from the great Chinese Wall, it's a Chinese name Xingnu, crossed the Volga River and pushed uh, German tribes, this is the ruling years of Attila, and the battle of Catalonian Plains battle, this was the equal result. And this is the trajectory of, uh, of the wave of migration, and I call your attention some wave of migration, German tribes of migration, even reached the northern part of Africa. And very interesting, probably you know the uh, name of, uh, uh, of uh, DNA archaeology. DNA archaeology. DNA, this is the uh, material of, uh, of uh, biological, how the name is, uh, it's a heritage material of the body. And somehow this is a calendar of the antecedents, not so exact because it's, each copy is lost some uh, percent of information, but very interesting, even now, even recently, on the population living in the North Africa, there is a 5% of German DNA came from the... Uh, came from the